what the Church of Scientology is so afraid of. This, this is SPTV. And we're back. Hey. Part two, Mitch Brisker. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, SC, Good to be back. Who am I Sorry welcoming back? Am I welcoming Mitch back? Or am I welcoming the audience back? I can't quite tell. Yeah, I think you're welcoming all of us. I mean, I feel welcomed back, so I'll just <laughs> I'll go with it. Um, I actually forget what uh, we were in the middle of when we took our first break, but but I, there, there's one thing that I think our Scientology watchers are uh, going to want to know about. Okay, uh, because we've spoken so far about the fact that you worked up at Golden Era Productions, worked close with David Miscavige from about roughly 1990 to a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. And whenever people hear about the international management, the international management base, David Miscavige, right. the biggest question that they have is, where's Shelly Miscavige? Okay. So as someone, and we haven't heard from anybody out of the Scientology bubble who's left, um, who has worked at international management as recently as you had. Yeah. What, what is your take? Yeah. That's on, my 15 minutes of fame. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like what's your take on Shelly? When's the last time you saw her? What's your understanding as to what's going on? My own personal opinion. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I knew Shelly uh, socially when I first went up there, I saw her a lot. We interacted on, coordinating things like birthday presents and things like that. But I didn't ever work with her. Uh, I can tell you I liked her. She was really a very personable individual. Um, and I didn't really notice when she was absent uh, because that was not an, in, that was not an or, in ordinary thing at the international base people would go off on missions sometimes you know they were prepping for a mission and they'd be gone i mean i remember a kid not a kid a young guy that i had twinned with on a i don't know key to life or something and he was in training to go open russia up so i expected not to ever see him again right but people would go off on missions and so i, I figured you know i always just figured shelly was off doing something right uh, then I said, when was it? What to, uh, Tom and Katie's wedding was in 2006, right? 2005, 2006. Okay, 2005, 2006. Okay, so I wasn't really thinking she was gone. Like, where's Shelly? You know, it wasn't a hashtag yet. And uh, so it was sometime between 2008-ish. Um, I stopped in Redlands, California, which is a, a, a town on the way up to the international base. Uh, it's actually the last place that's worth stopping at that isn't an Indian casino or a shopping outlet, an outlet mall on the way to gold until you get to Palm Springs. Like there's nothing else. So that, that's where you'd want to stop. If you were driving to the international base and you were going to time your Monday arrival for lunchtime, you, you'd want to, you'd want to stop there. So I, I stopped there often, but then one time, this one time I saw Shelly and she was with, the people that are reportedly, you know, her handlers and um, who I knew all of them. And I, I didn't really, Aaron, I didn't really think anything of it because it wasn't a thing with me. Right. And uh, they looked over at me. So I was like, I, I, I needed to be polite. I would have walked over anyway to say hi. One of them had been my auditor and RTC staff member. And so I knew her really well. I mean, she, I had that kind of relationship with her, right? So I walked over there and I talked like, hi, how are you doing? And we didn't talk about anything. And it looked no different to me than four girlfriends out for lunch on a sunny day. I mean, they were laughing and having fun. And I mean, you know, she'd only been absent for a couple of years. So that's different than 17 years. Maybe her mood would have was changed. This, was this like a Chipotle or something? Exactly. It was out in front of, yeah, it was a, a Chipotle or a Quiznos or a Sharkies or like, you know. It was I mean, one so, of those. somebody who understands the Sierra culture would argue that if Shelly was in trouble or uh, under watch or anything, she wouldn't be going out for lunch at a Chipotle. Well, she she did. Okay, so. I'm just I mean, saying. I, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. I'm just saying see your culture would indicate uh, someone who is considered a flight risk doesn't get to go for lunch at Chipotle. That's all I'm saying. I didn't notice. <laughs> yes, that's true. I didn't notice. Okay, so if you look at uh, the CST base on a map, Crest, Crest View, whatever it is up in Lake, uh, up in Crest, Big Bear. Crestline. If you look at that, yeah, Crestline, and you sort of follow the road down, 
and until you, the first place you get to in civilization is Redlands. Okay. So if you were going to go and go to lunch and go shopping, that's where you would go. And Redlands is really nice. I mean, it's an upscale area. I mean, you know. Okay. So you saw Shelly, you spoke to her in about 2008 in Redlands. Yeah. Eight ish. I mean, I, I, I've really racked my brain to put it together because you know, the, where Shelly, what happened to Shelly hashtag really started with anonymous and so, no, no, no. That started with Sh that started with um, Leah Remini. Yeah, but I'm. It did. You're absolutely right. But but seeing it physically, publicly, signs on the streets in, at, at protests, that was in with. Um, I mean, uh, Leah is what inspired them to do where Shelley, But that's when it really became a big thing. I mean, it's a big, bigger thing now, but. Anonymous really helped to launch it more into the force. So, but I wasn't even thinking with it, Aaron. I wasn't even thinking like it's a thing. Like, Wait, but, ooh. But when would you have seen? I'm I'm getting it mixed up between the timing of Leah Remini leaving Scientology and the anonymous stuff. I thought the anonymous stuff was around 2008. Leah Remini yeah, it didn't was. leave. Leah Remini didn't leave Scientology until 2013. That's right. But when did Tommy Davis give her that horrifically stupid answer? You don't have the rank to be asking that. At Tom Cruise's wedding, yeah, which but, kicked the whole thing off. But but Anonymous didn't find out about what happened at Tom Cruise's wedding until after Leah Remini left Scientology. Correct? Okay, good. Okay, well, yeah. So yeah, so I, I've never been able to date this thing. It's like weird, but it was definitely after she was gone. So. Oh, date the time that you saw her. Saw yeah, saw because of like here's the only criteria is. When I saw her, I didn't think, oh, there's Shelly. In other words, it, oh. to me, it hadn't emerged yet as this issue. I get it. It right? wasn't even a big to deal because it wasn't an, it wasn't a thing. But then I was also living in a bubble, not so much a bubble as as the Sea Org members by far. Sure. So it wasn't a big deal. I was still, it was still in my universe, the kind of thing that was like, eh, she could have been off on a mission. I wasn't going to ask her because it's just like well, right to you, she wasn't missing. She wasn't missing. There was she nothing wasn't that, missing. There was nothing. I just not about. seen her in a long time. In a few years, I hadn't seen her at the base. I hadn't seen her that. But I mean, my attitude on the whole thing, and they were genuinely relaxed and having lunch and enjoying their time together. Uh, they're all fellow staff members. I mean, three people in the in RTC and one CST guy, woman. Yeah, and they're like friends. They're hanging out. Sure. And so I've always just had the impression that. You know, you hear hashtag we're Shelly and, and, you know, I think there's people that would like you to think that she's chained to a bed in a mountain fortress, you know, which is not the case. Uh, that place is really cush. I mean, that's a bougie compound. Which place? That place is my understanding. Which place? Oh, I'm sorry. The CST base where she is rumored allegedly living, okay, mm -hmm. in, up in Big Bear. Have you been there? Line. No, I have not, but I did a lot of, I've driven by it, uh, but um, I did a lot of work projects for CST and I've seen photos of it. And Mark Fisher, who's there, we talked about this and he's like, oh yeah, that place is like, it's five star. I mean, I'm not sure where I got this, but I, I have every reason to believe this is true. I think I got it on, it's just, you don't think, you don't record these things because you don't think they're ever going to be important. But somewhere I got the idea that that facility where she is, was built to the standards where if there was ever some incredible disaster in LA, like, you know, nuclear, biological, man-made, you know, act of God, and you had to get out of LA, that that place was built to a standard where people like Miscavige and Tom Cruise could go there and seek refuge. Oh yeah, probably. Yeah. So it's really built to a very high standard. You know, I'm sure she's living in a lovely cabin. But all that means is that it's a secure facility. I mean, um, well, you know. yeah, but it's, but secure, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah. If, if, um, if the Four Seasons Hotel was a secure facility, I mean, sure. it's, like, it, it's no, but that, look, these Scientology properties do have that weird marriage of luxury and comp, uh, half luxury, yeah, some half do. compound. <laughs> yeah, some do. I was just trying to stress the fact that her, I mean, there's two things. There's quality of living and there's quality of and there's lifestyle, right? Quality of life, rather. And there's standard of living. I'm sorry, the two separate things. Consider this. You have standard of living and you have quality of life, okay? Her standard of living, I'm sure, is very high. Her quality of life is very low, okay? Because she has no freedom. You, you yeah. get what I'm saying? Totally. Like, 
like 100%. it's the same with everybody at gold they have a they have a their standard of living is well above the average they, they live in a nice place they sleep on 400 thread egyptian cotton they have a organic food and a decent cook and an italian baker you know who made you know Shelly's, I'm sorry, uh, Tom's and Katie's birthday uh, wedding cake. You know, they've got all these perks, right? And they have educational opportunities and all sorts of things, but they they can't just take a break and go down to Starbucks, which is, so they have a pretty decent standard of living, right? Even with 50 bucks a week, because they don't really have expenses, yeah. but their quality of life is really low. You know, when you have 300 people probably half of whom are the opposite gender from you. And that's your entire dating pool. And you can't date unless you get married. That's a low, that's a poor quality of life. Right. You go to work every day making films. And the only thing you can make films about is L. Ron Hubbard or Scientology or Dianetics. That from an artist's point of view is just a shame. I mean, there's, there's nothing to aspire to in that. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I became so frustrated and left was I couldn't take the monotony of the same subject to an artist. That's just death. It's right. just like, you know, it's like if, if, if Van Gogh had done nothing but paintings of sunflowers and vases, <laughs> I think he would have cut his ears off a lot right. sooner. But you know, can I just real quick comment on the, yeah, uh, please. the difference or relationship between standard of living and quality of life? Cause I, I other than before five minutes ago would have said those were the same thing, but you're they're not, they're entirely different. Right. So you're differentiating them. So I'm thinking of now, now I'm, I'm rethinking this. I'm thinking of some poor kids in India or rural Mexico who have a low standard of living, but a high quality of life because they, they could. Love, yes. Yes. Because they, they, could. Cause they love every single day of their existence. They don't, they don't know what it would be like to have air conditioning, but they don't give a shit. They're, yeah. They're, they're seeing, they're, they're, they're seen by their parents. Their parents love them just because they're there. Yeah, they have a very good quality of life, but they have a poor standard of living. They're two entirely different things. So you would characterize the int base, because I would argue that people at the int base probably have some of the more creature comforts than people at, say, the pack base in L.A. So yeah, it absolutely. never occurred to me that you might characterize life at the int base as decent standard of living, terrible yeah. quality of life. That's pretty That's interesting. That's exactly how I, I did it. As a matter of fact, mm. this is a, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump subjects a little bit, but when I did the few times that I acted as a flying monkey and I was pressed into service by a psychopath, um, I'm keep in mind in the Wizard of Oz when the flying monkeys were freed with the death of the Wicked Witch of the West, they were really happy, cheerful, fun creatures. So they're only that way because they're under the influence of this evil witch so um but so when i was being a flying monkey and talking out against on for the when the abc thing, 2020 show happened i'm sorry my brain jumps forward really quickly when i did that i pretty much extemporized ex, I, was, I was spontaneous about the whole thing it was written, not written it wasn't scripted uh, you know what i'm talking about the videos that are on did, did, i'm sorry did i just lose everybody I don't know. You said the ABC 2020 thing. Yeah. Okay. So when Ron Miscavige was releasing his book, he gave an exclusive to ABC 2020. Right. And so they, I'm sure reached out to the church, probably, you know, Osa and said, we're doing this show on Robert uh, uh, with Ron Miscavige about the release of his book, Ruthless, where he's going to eviscerate his son, David Miscavige. And we would like to, you to comment. Do you have a comment? We can talk later about what the comment was, but, but do you have a response? What is your response? We would like you to respond. We can talk later about what the response is because it's really worth talking about. But part of the response was, you know, we all went up to gold. I was at Scientology Media Productions at that time. We all went up to gold and we shot days of videos and interviews and me and another pro that worked with Miss Gavage and Monique Yingling. And, you know, we all sat there and just like said, no, he's awesome. Ron Miscavige, bad. David Miscavige, good. Uh, what son stabs his father in the back? You know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but when I did that, I, I, the camera was almost done rolling and I said, hold on, I just want to say something. And I knew what I was expected to say. And I did it because he was my friend and we all will tell the, you know, bend the truth a little to help our friends if that's what it takes. And I said, wait a minute, there's something that really bugs me. People are always saying that 
Sea Org members are slaves because they work for 50 bucks a week, right? And I said, well, you know, the, it doesn't relate because they have nice housing at Gold. They have really good food. They have an exercise trial. You know, they have every Sunday morning off. They, they love, most of them really love what they're doing. And they don't really need a lot of money. So I was defending, I was saying, you know, this is bullshit. Because when you look at their standard of living, the standard of living of most people, the $50 a week doesn't reflect it. It's a completely doesn't reflect it, right? Um, it, they, it, it, so, and I was, you know, I, was, I was protesting on this video that I, it's not on the website. It didn't go to ABC. And, uh, but I just felt like I made the statement because it pissed me off because, you know, even though I was paid for a long time, a lot of money, I used to joke with the crew. Yeah, you get 50 bucks, but at the end of the next week, you still got 10 bucks in your pocket. I'm fucking broke, you know, between, you know, alimony and Uncle Sam and <laughs> a mortgage and all this other stuff. I don't have anything. You know, you guys at least have some cash. Uh, and so that, you know, that was, and I really believe that, right? Especially at the end base, because things are definitely nicer up there, right? Uh, but then later I thought about it. And that's when I realized, yeah, their standard of living, you know, they ain't poor folk in Appalachia, right? But their quality of life is horrific. And that's when I realized they're two totally different things. You could be a billionaire living in a castle and dying of cancer. You have a great, you know, standard of living, but boy, you have no quality of life. Yeah, I mean, so, I think, um, you know, I've speculated as to what, uh, how poor Miscavige's quality of life must actually be. Um, you know, hating everyone around him, being paranoid, uh, constantly being on the run from process servers, not not actually being close with anyone, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, you could you could quanta you could sort of yeah you you could equate that as a quality of life. Yeah, no, his standard of living is fantastic. I mean, he's eating. You know, he's like uh, what did we used to say? He's uh, uh, you know, he's farting through silk underwear and pissing on ice. You know. <laughs> Yeah. To put it so in the, let me ask you a question. Heart. So if we were to say maybe it was roughly around 2008 that you saw Shelly, she'd only uh -huh. been out of the public eye for a few years at that point. Uh huh. What about between 2008 and 2020? The other like 13, 12 to 13 I guess, years. I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Hold I on. never heard anything. Hold on. Hold on. Yep, um, we're okay. What What about the the whole not? seeing her at all from that point on did it you said by the time you started in 2008 it wasn't a thing you didn't you wasn't hadn't a thing. she wasn't missing you uh, meaning you hadn't missed her you didn't realize you sh she should have been seen or anything but over right. the years the many many years as they rolled by did that not change oh yeah totally did I, oh yeah totally yeah i mean it's too long i mean you're i'm working with this guy i see him all the time we're friendly. I mean, I have to just say that there's no such thing as friends in, in the Sea Org. To some degree in Scientology, but nobody has friends in the Sea Org. There's people you're friendly with, but you can't confide in anybody. And if you can't confide in a person, they're not your friend. I mean, bottom line. So, yeah, there was a lot of people I was friendly with. Um, and, you know, the guy's wearing a wedding ring, and I haven't seen his wife in 12 years. What am I going to think? Did, right? What did anybody ever say about it? Nobody ever talked about it. Nobody ever talked about it. Did you ever at any point go, hey, you seen Shelly lately? No. Huh. I mean, fuck, man. That's just like, no, that you just knew better than to ask stuff like that. Wow. I mean, you, you don't want to know. Uh, I mean, I, 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 it made perfect sense to me when I heard, oh, you know, she's living up at Crestline because I'm like, well, yeah, I saw her at Redlands. Redlands. So, and I, I don't know what kind of work she's doing. Somebody mentioned on on uh, the other channel um, that uh, there's, a, I didn't remember it, but there, there is a ton of like transcriptions and different things to do with L. Ron Hubbard's materials. And she's probably working on all that. Honestly, Aaron, I think she's relieved to be out of the shit show. I'm, I'm, she's like, come on. She's been there in a Scientology since she was eight. There's nothing out here. We are like, you know, she's like living in the matrix and everything outside of the matrix is just like, you don't want to go out there, man. Like there is nothing else. Like that's just the end of, it's the end of existence outside yeah. that bubble. There's no, you know, it's, it is all of that and more. So why would she want to leave? I mean, you could drag her out of there kicking and screaming. She's still doing work for her surrogate father who was L. Ron Hubbard. 
you know, and I, I mean, I don't want to, I really liked Shelly. I thought she was really kind to me and to my former wife and my, you know, whatever it was like. Um, so, but she's, that's her thing. It's her religious belief. I'm sure she's still doing Hubbard's work and he's coming back and it's all going to change. Plus, you know, it's, the, it's a this lifetime thing. Yeah. Like I can remember having that thought. Like it's every Scientologist has that thought. Well, you know, next lifetime, I'm not going to make that mistake. You said that to yourself when you were in Scientology. You said something about next lifetime. Did you not? Did you ever have why, a thought? Why would I be worried about next lifetime if I'm living this lifetime? No, no, no. I'm not. I don't want to have a philosophical discussion with you. That's not the point. But you're in Scientology and you're thinking, well, that's not going to happen next lifetime or whatever. Or next lifetime, I think maybe I'll be a rock star or whatever. In any way, did you ever consider your future existence as being a real thing? Mm. Did you? I'm just curious. Your future existence as being a real well, something that's real, thing? like you're going to have another lifetime. Oh, I always assumed I would have other lifetimes. I just didn't worry about them. I was too worried about this lifetime. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not saying. Yeah. OK, good. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> well, aren't we all? Hey, Aaron, this is the only one you should worry about. So <laughs> that's like. Uh, but my only point is that it was very real to you that you're going to have future lifetimes. And uh, it's very real to her that she's going to be in Scientology for at least a billion years, if not longer. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So she's just biding her time. It's just like, I think, I think people are just too excited. They get a little too overly excited about the word Shelly thing. Cause it's like, maybe, but let me ask you this. But it's, you this. It, it's really shitty that he banished her, especially cause you know, in, in my mind, he has a, a sexual relationship or romantic relationship with his current assistant. And I have, very good reasons to say that. You and, think he's hooking up with Larice? Uh, no doubt. I think she, you know, you want to, you want to, you want a clickbait headline, you know, the she's woman so, behind. She's the so woman ugly. Be, oh, well, we're not, I don't do that. Okay. I don't do short. It's okay, Aaron, nothing against you, but I don't do body shaming. Okay. Um, but she's, she's, not she's, not, she's not attractive at all. I know, but relationships aren't necessarily built on looks. Just mm. like leadership isn't built on sanity, you know. So, uh, but I, he, he, the clickbait uh, uh, line is the woman behind the disappearance of Shelley Miscavige, right? Is who, Larice? Yeah, like who's not going to click on that? I mean, to me, she probably had a lot more to do with Shelley's disappearance than anybody's letting on. Huh. Unless, unless you, mean as, you mean as far as just like whispering in Dave's ear about her? Getting what? her the fuck out of there. But only yeah, Dave, was, only Dave could do that though. That's right. But I think she's the uh I think she pulled some strings and she's influenced the, uh, him. She's an instigator. Yeah, it's either that or Dave and Lou have the most sweetest platonic relationship of any two people. They're either brother and sister, like they could sleep in the same bed and it wouldn't matter, or they're full on. Lovers. I but mean, it's to... not it's not my place to say that they are or aren't anything. I mean, Leah not did either. Leah did notice Lou getting a little handsy with yeah, the scavenge yeah. at Tom Cruise's wedding. In fact, that's why Leah said, "Where's Shelley?" Right. Yeah. It's not just because she was missing Shelley. It's because she saw what she thought was Lou acting inappropriately with Dave. Yeah, she she saw him. She saw her playing like grab ass with. By the way, for scavenge. the people watching, Lou is short for Larice. Yeah. So, but does she go by Lou? Yeah, she's Lou. Ah, oh, well, I, yeah, I don't. I never call those people by their names. She's CCR. That's her post title. What does CCR mean? Uh, it stands for COB's communicator for route, whatever. It's some COB thing. Oh. I, I I could never remember, but she's CCR. Wow. That's her. That's her post title, and she is notably. I got along great with Lou. I really like Lou, uh, and you know she has two sisters that are in the Sea Org. Mm. One of her sisters was the late L. L. Ron Hubbard's biographer's assistant. The other one, I don't know what she does. She's married to Dave Bloomberg. You know Dave Bloomberg? You know who he is? He's the, mm -hmm. yeah, he was the guy who uh, made sure that Scientology would always look horrific on the internet. I mean, he's, he's the one who engineered that. He's a horrible human being. Uh, but, um, 
So, but let me ask I, you. I said I wasn't going to get into talking about people, and now I'm being a tabloid guy. But whatever, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So it's one thing to talk about Shelly, but she's been gone for so long. What did you right. observe about some of the other executives that have been completely uh, disappeared from the public eye? Guillaume Lasserve and Mark Yeager. Let's stick with those two. Okay. Very people that I got along with really well. I know Mark could be nasty to some people. So, like, where the hell are they? What are they doing? There, well, Mark, uh, he's the last I know, and I, this is probably still the case. He's teamed up with Jenny uh, Linson, uh, who is a CMO staff. I've known Jenny since she was a little girl. Um, she, Jenny, was one of the. I don't know how to describe it. She That's was okay. In the, so he's teamed up with Jenny, and what? Yeah, you just need to know that Jenny was one of the S and M bondage queens, inflicting pain on people in the hole. Okay, she was one of the ones with the whips and chains. And the high heels and the stiletto heels. <laughs> yeah, she's always what, been Scientology's biggest royal bitch. So, but yeah, what but about she. The, but you said yeah, you so, said Mark's teamed up with her in what? They're like a special. They're like a commando hit squad. Mm. Like they're they're attack dogs that miscavige six on problems, right? Like I, I they're just sort of how there's like oh yeah, there's, we've seen them. De we've seen them deployed in a number of scenarios like. Ambushing people at airports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're spec ops. Should we just call them that? <laughs> sure. So, but Mark yeah. Yeager and Guillaume Lasserve, where are they and what are they doing? Well, that's that. Mark is working with Jenny in spec ops. He's a special operative who gets deployed to you know handle unique problems, shall we say? That's um, like that's like once every three years or something. What does he do in a day? Oh no, you'd be I don't know. I I mean I I have no idea. I I didn't deal with him in a long time. I mean. You know, 2014, I, I went to, uh, I was at ASI for uh, almost two years, or yeah, working uh, a year and a half, working on the new Narconon program with Miscavige and another writer. And then we moved from there to SMP. And uh, are you so, saying you saw Mark and Guillaume there, or that's why you didn't see them after that? No, moment? I used to see them at the base. I mean, I used to see them a lot. I, there's a funny story in my book where I told Jenny. If she said something to me one more time, if she said one more time to me that COB is expecting you to get this done, it was with respect to the industry of death museum. And I hadn't slept in weeks and I was just not in the mood. And she was really badgering me. And I mean, come on, I've known her since I was a little girl. So she was a little girl, but um, she kept badgering me. And I one day, I, one night, I just I was on my hands and knees and I was drawing out a, a, a large chart. I was designing the history of psychiatry. It's fucking brilliant. Okay. But um, I, uh, she did it one too many times and I got up and I just got in her face and I very quietly and calmly, I said, Jim, if you say that to me one more time, I'm going to shove your head into a wall. Now I'm not that. So I kind of take that as a badge of honor that I told Jenny Linson to, to I was going to shove her head on the wall. But um, so the next day, Miscavige came by and he was laughing and he said, I heard you have a, had a run in with Jenny. And I was thought I was that was it. I'm in trouble now. Right. Because she's a top CMO executive. And so I said, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said I'm going to shove your head into a wall. And he looked at me and he just laughed and he said, I don't care if you do. So <laughs> I don't know how that's going to strike anybody. But that was and that just shows you the kind of leadership. Yeah. Miscavige is like, yeah. I don't care if you mistreat my subordinates. Yeah, I don't care okay. if you do it. Go ahead. Shove her head into the wall. Um, but he, he was like that way, but it, you know, it was kind of, he had this really unique way of staying out of the fray. Like, that's a great way to stay out of it. I don't care if you do like nonchalantly, but he brought it up, not me. Like he's the one who said, I heard you had a run in with Jenny. So I don't know what they're doing. I know what the other guys are doing. I, the last I saw them, I know that Guillaume who's really a lovely guy. I mean, I always got along great with him. Um, uh, he, when they all got let out of the hole, they went on to this project called the uh, Analog Project. And basically what that was, over the decades and decades, Scientology, uh, upper management, uh, international level, whatever, had accumulated warehousefuls of analog material, which would be videotapes, photographs, recordings, documents. They all existed in the analog uh, 
universe, and they all needed to be transitioned over to digital and indexed so that they could be searchable on a database, right? And that's what they all got put onto, is digitizing. Just mind-numbing work. Uh, some of them went like, uh, a few of them, like Hansuli Stali, who was like a famous, you may have heard of him. Did you ever hear of him, Hansuli Stali? He was a mm -hmm. big time RTC attack dog. He was, he was, uh, well, you did not want to deal with that guy, man. He was like Swiss German and had that accent. He, he, I used to call him Hansuli Stasi because of the, you know, German secret police. Uh, but he ended up as a, a, he's a dolly grip. He's pushing a dolly and he's really bad at it. Uh, and then another guy, Mike Sutter, who was another one of the hitmen, he's in the camera department. Uh, you know, Miss Gavage loved dumping people in Cine, so in, into the filmmaking department. So that's what they're doing. I mean, Greg Wilhair is on the analog project. He, he's just a great, I mean, he's a great guy, man. He was like a, 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 you know, he helped me a lot when I was like working there just to make sure that, you know, I was in a bubble. So, hmm. you know, yeah. Um, here's a question specifically for you. And we actually haven't even touched on this. So let's just go down this route here. Pat Shore, Mitch, why and how did you leave the Church of Scientology? Um, I ducked out the back door when the pandemic happened. I left because I couldn't stand it anymore. I couldn't stand the, the okay, so here's one thing that Scientology is guilty of that really, uh, which all abusive groups, coercive groups, high control groups are guilty of, is they demand a level of interaction with their members that is intolerable. Like you need to place that activity at the forefront as the center point of your life that everything revolves around. And I, after a while, I couldn't take it anymore. And I didn't care. I mean, I stayed for years because I was like, you know, I'm making good money. I'll just save enough to leave. I'll just quietly duck out. And then when the pandemic came, I did. But I didn't leave because I was uh, like physically abused or blah, blah, blah. Or I mean, and then over the last number of years, a uh, few years, they just started paying me less and demanding more and, and uh, being more critical of my behavior, which I'll admit some of it was way unacceptable in terms of the level of ethics that a Sea Org member is supposed to abide by. But I wasn't in the Sea Org. So, uh, and I'm sure they're going to have a fun with all of my folders when they do that. I don't really care. But, you know, fundamentally, I'm not here to slam anybody. I'm here to help tell what the story is about Scientology so that it, it can just kind of, we can start to undo the harm that it and other groups have done. You know, I've heard you say this, Aaron, that none of us care what anybody believes in or something like it. We just care what they do. Right. So, you know. Here, check I, this out. Check this yeah. out. I think you're going to find this interesting. Yeah. So Scientology still has. <laughs> oh, I know about that. I know about that. I, that's, that's, I know. Be, so hold we, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Are you going to so embarrass is, me now? No, no, we're not going to play a video or anything. Okay. I just want, this is the website because, you know, uh, Scientology has websites up over anyone who's spoken out publicly, right. practically. And they created one specifically about Ron Miscavige. And then they produced all this stuff of people who used to work with him, basically right. shitting all over him. And they still have whatever it is they had you do. Right. And I know. I, I'm, I, I wanted say, to. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I wanted to ask you about that process. So what they come to you, they go, Ron Miscavige. Because you knew Ron Miscavige personally. Uh, yeah, uh, really well. And I, so I knew him before I went to Gold. I'd met him somewhere. I was living with a girl and she, an actress, and she met him somewhere. And he like hit on her, really hit on her. And she was like, I don't know, 25 or something. Uh, he had, and he was relentlessly pursuing her for a while. So I made that into a story. You know, hey, Ron Miscavige was like, this you know middle aged oh, man was hitting oh, on my. Well, hold on, hold on. You're getting ahead. Of, you're getting ahead there. So okay. So they come to you and they go. Ron Miscavige has escaped, but but he escaped well before he ever wrote his book. So at what point did you find out Ron had blown? Well, I knew about it immediately. I mean, you got to remember, Aaron. I was there was a certain point, or keep this in mind. There was a certain point where I transitioned from not just being the director, but to being an operative, like I was asked to participate in things because Miss Gavich knew that I was a really good problem solver and I didn't do stupid fucking things like 
like Tommy Davis when he told Leo Remini, you don't have the rank. He should have said, oh, Shelly's off on a mission. She couldn't be here. She really is sorry she's missing it. And I'll tell her you said hello. That's all he had to say, right? Yeah, and, exactly. And, and nothing would have happened. Yeah. So uh, I, they knew that I was trusted to always kind of say the right thing in the right circumstances. It's true. She was on a special mission. Right. <laughs> she, so, 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 um, Ronnie, uh, Ron Miscavige blows. They I knew the day, I knew like the day that he left. I mean, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, so go on. Ask. So, what, what See, you have to, yeah, it's, it's weird, Aaron. Like, what do they tell, what do they tell you? It, about it's it? weird because you're asking me that question. I'm like, that's such a stupid question. Isn't it obvious? And of course, it's not obvious. I'm intrigued by the fact that you'd have to ask that. Isn't, what, isn't what obvious? How I would be engaged to do that. Engaged to do what? To speak out against Ron on the internet. Like, isn't I, that what I you're do, asking? I do not wonder how you were engaged to do oh, that. Oh, okay, good. Because, I, I I, yeah, but you, I mean, in terms of your question about how did it happen? Well, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so and when, when I say it's a stupid question, I'm saying that I'm so out of it that that appears like a stupid question, but it's not. It's a really good question. That was my point. Okay. So they tell you that Ron has escaped. You knew he escaped right away. But what yeah. did they What did they tell you, though? They don't say anything. It's just like Ron what did You just said they told you. So what did they oh, tell you? Oh, when the thing with the, the – yeah, they say, like, yeah, he blew. He gone, he's gone. But are, you're – are you interested in knowing when the it was the show ABC 2020, right? They they received an exclusive to uh, do a, a a segment on the book, a 2020 exclusive. Uh, David Miscavige's father is, wrote a tell-all, and uh, so let's scrap 2020 for a second. Yeah, okay. I, nothing about 2020. So that's not the part of it you're interested in. No, 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 no. Okay. So they tell you he blew, but they don't yeah. give you some kind of a short story or a whole bunch of, they didn't weave some big tale. They're just no, like, Ron I mean, blew. There's nothing else to say. Oh, I mean, there could be a lot more to say, but no, you're saying they didn't. We, like, what more could there be to say? He blew. I mean, I, I mean, I, usually I, they wouldn't tell you that at all. They tell you he went on a special project. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's kind of like, yeah. It's... Okay. So he blew. They told you he blew. They didn't tell you anything else. Fast yeah, forward a whole fast forward a whole bunch of years. Ron's writing a book. Right. They didn't create this hate site about him until I can't remember which came first, the book or Leah's show. I think the book probably came first. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So what I'm wondering though is you're a guy, not a Sea Orc member, public uh -huh. guy. They come uh -huh. to you. How do they come to you and say, hey, we want you to help us produce a whole bunch of false negative shit about Ron Miscavige, David Miscavige's dad. How does that <laughs> unfold? I'm, I, I, I don't know. I'm dying to okay. know. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, yeah. Okay. It's that whole story has so much funny stuff going on. So a ABC 2020 has the exclusive, right? The, on the book, right? In terms of to, the, they did the show like two weeks before the book came out or a week before it came out. It was uh, like Oh, I see. The 2020 thing is tied to the book. Okay. It's all about the book. That's the okay. whole, it's all about the book. Okay. So, okay, fine. You know, Ron left and he's being, you know, I mean, I, the guy was so badly treated while he was there. Um, and he's an old guy and he's a sweet old guy. Uh, it, it just didn't surprise me that he left at all because it was just like, he's getting older and it's just like, you know, I mean, if nothing else, he's just tired of kowtowing to his son you know it was just so awkward like yes sir no sir you know it was like anyway so they come um, to you and they're like ron's writing a book we need to produce a whole bunch of hit no, material on him no no it wasn't until the tv show there's going to be a tv show on abc i was at working at scientology media productions there's going to be a tv show we need to give abc a response i'm sure abc act said we're going to do the show and we're, you know, do you care to respond? Because that's what they do. That's what the corporate media does. That's the tactic. Um, they ask for a response. They'll take the response. When you say you, ABC, are you talking about 2020 or are you talking about the Aftermath show? Uh, no, a, 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 Aftermath was on um, AMC. I, sorry. I, uh, a a and &E. A and E, sorry, but two different networks. So no. Um, so all of the hate material produced about Ron Miscavige was in response to the 2020 stuff they were going to do on his book. Hundred percent. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's 
all of those videos that are on there. Okay, look, Aaron, I, I was working around them. Like the, it was like, what, Miscavige walked 10 feet and said, we're going up to gold. We're going to make a bunch of videos because Ron's going to be on 2020 and we need to video a response and send it to ABC. I mean, that's how it happened. It was just like, mm. bada boom, as they say. You know, but, but it's like, but it's like so much of the stuff in the videos though is complete, f completely false. Yeah. I knew that so, when I was doing it. So, but that's kind of what I'm wanting to dig into the meat here. Are they like, Hey, we want you to shit all over Ron, just ad lib it. Or are they telling you what they want you to say? No, it's more like this. If you were going to paint him black, how would you do it? And I'm like, well, I would do it like this because I'm a writer is one of the things I do. And so you don't need to tell me how to do that. Mm. Okay. We have a need to uh, impugn this character. You knew him. How would you impugn him? And I said, well, I do this. I mean, I remember before I ever worked for you guys, he, he hit on my girlfriend and I thought it was kind of gross. Right. Cause he was really seducing her. Like he was, she came home and said, I met this musician from gold. And he said, if I come up there, I could be in films and they teach me to sing. And I was just like, Oh my God. Uh, and he was trying to, you know, recruit her for this era. Cause he wanted to, you know, he was hitting on her, whatever. Um, I don't blame him. He's just, it's really hard. There's not a lot of, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> she was pretty and there wasn't a lot of anyway, whatever. That was the only thing that had any relevance to reality. The rest of it, it was like if somebody came to me and said, you know, we need you to impugn Aaron Smith Levin. I go, well, what can I do? Okay, how would I do that? It's fiction, man. You're writing fiction. And you need and you have a need to do it because you want to protect that group. Because uh, even though a lot of things about them I didn't like, they were paying me really well. And, and, in, and in this one strange way, I really liked David Miscavige. He'd done a lot of really nice things for me. And he was... He's incredibly hardworking. I mean, some people will say, yeah, he rolls in at noon. Yeah, because he was up all night. I mean, yeah, he lives by different rules. And, you know, he wears $4,000 suits and diamond pinky rings and all that kind of shit. And he flies around in Tom Cruise's jet and he has this amazing lifestyle. But very often he was the smartest guy in the room. And he is, you want to be afraid of David Meskiewicz? Be, be a, this guy is a brilliant tactician, okay? You can never discount him. You can, he, you know, he's not going anywhere. He's this guy knows. I mean, but not he, brilliant enough to figure out how to keep expanding Scientology, though. Well, but yeah, but you, uh, nobody is expanding Scientology. You don't understand. Maybe no, you don't get it. And he is. This is what you have to do. Maybe you have to go through these periods where things are a little smaller or whatever. But at the end of the day, he's going to prevail. So yeah, I'm just trying to express the mindset I was in. I'm not trying to <laughs> preach to you about I'm just trying to give you like some idea, right? So it's like, plus, you know, reality is the reality of the situation is such that, well, I'm just, I'm sorry, I got distracted by something. The reality of the situation is such that, you know, we really do believe of, in the mission that Scientology is going, it is needed for man's future. Yeah. Uh, survival. And even when you get out of that, you still believe you want to help that group. It's weird. I, I don't, it's like a trauma bond. If you've never been there, you can't really describe it. But, you know, I didn't necessarily, it, believing what I was saying about Ron was, it didn't matter. Right. I, I just, I, I, no, I, I hear just, you. Yeah. Sure, sure. I hear you. I hear you. Is it fair to say? Okay. Um, let me just say one thing. Okay. I do believe, even I thought at that time, that he raised a monster. And that was the 100% truthful thing. But was I going to say that? <laughs> but let me tell you, the worst thing about Ramos Gowdy, he raised an absolute monster. Yeah. I wasn't going to say that. So, you know, I was, I was fulfilling a role. And part of what I'm doing today is to apologize isn't the right word, but I want to bring some truth to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um you know, I said before that what would make you uniquely interesting to the Scientology watchers is that you spent so many decades at Int and working closely with Miscavige as a yeah. non steerg member. And there really is no one else like that other than, like you said, Dan Sherman, who's dead, and whoever the other guy you mentioned earlier, who I don't know who he is. He also passed away. So Right. But it's also interesting to me because I've never spoken to someone who has lived what many might call a Sea Org life 
while not being a Sea Org member. And so I do have my own yeah. personal inquiries as to what the what what your state of mind was. So, for sure. example, when Ron Miscavige blew and you were told that he blew, were you yeah. enough of the Sea Org mindset or whatever that you felt like that was a betrayal to the group or to you? No, I was glad for him. Oh, wow. Yeah, but then was, so so then when when Dave comes around later and is like, OK, so, you know, this elderly senior citizen father of mine who escaped, he's now writing a book. And so we need to destroy him. What was your mindset at that time? OK, I'll help you. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, paydays on Thursday or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I'm just I'm I'm not. I've become a nice person. Okay. I had to deal with the fact that I did some of these things. 99% of the stuff I did for Scientology was nothing like that. Um, I never participated in any of the squirrel buster stuff, which you, you guys might want to do some squirrel buster swag in your shop. Because <laughs> pro tip, but it, because I'm thinking that's the one thing that's missing from your SP TV shop is you don't have anything that's like, squirrel busted or something well, yeah. i was a squirrel buster and all i got was this crappy t-shirt or whatever but um yeah i did you know yeah i did things like that I, um they uh, i wasn't really a dirty tricks guy but i was really good at pr as uh, i was very creative and and uh so i would get pressed in a service on things like countering anonymous you know, which we could talk endlessly about that. I mean, I was right in the middle of that whole thing. and I devoted an entire chapter to it. I mean, there's so much people don't get about the whole anonymous movement. Um, it's not even funny. But so it was really the book that came out. I mean, the guy blew and it's whatever. Let's just get back to work. I mean, nobody, it's not like, oh, Ron blew. It's like, whatever. Plus, I mean, I was relieved for him because I knew he was miserable. And he, he, you know, he was a decent trumpet player. And you know, he would have been happier with a small band in a Vegas lounge. Like he would have been happy as a pig and shit. But all the musicians at Gold are expected to be uh, film composers, music composers for film and video. And they do have a very good composer up there who for years, but before he showed up, uh, Ron was one of the team that was expected to go. And I had to work with him on a few projects where he composed music for projects I was doing. And he was not suited to that particular activity. He was not. Uh, he was a good musician, but he wasn't a film con composer. But you I, know, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine being some sort of a creative artistic type and having to uh, live under that regime at international management. And it just doesn't even make sense. Well, to me. Well, that's why they needed me. They needed somebody who wasn't another guy. I mean, that's a whole nother story. I don't want to get all off into it, but I was there for a few weeks and I asked the script supervisor, how come none of you guys want to, aren't pursuing becoming directors? I mean, it's like the cushiest best job on the base. You know, it got, you get all kinds of perks you know, you couldn't be, you know, all Sea Org members, they want to do L. Ron Hubbard's work, right? When you were in the Sea Org, that's what you were doing. And uh, there's no greater work than being a film director, doing Ron's films, even auditing. I mean, Ms. Gavage told me once they have a point system for recruitment. Like if you recruit somebody, you get points, right? You earn points. And so it was like, you know, you're run of the mill, get somebody in the, I don't know, a 12, pretty 12 year old girl at for bridge is worth like two points, right? And then it goes up from there. And then you get up to like a now, class eight. This, this, I mean, this isn't true. What? That's not true. No, I was joking about the pretty girl for bridge, but it, there is a point system. If you're recruiting, you know, everything is statisized and, and you have to have key points, right? So if you recruit a guy who's uh, just out of high school versus you recruit somebody, let's say who's a doctor, you should get more points. Like statistically, that's a better statistic, no? I mean, it's you know, not. Well, yeah, it is. If, there, if if you need a doctor or a dentist at a Are bakery. you talking about how it should be or how it is? No, how it is. You get more points. You get on your graph that week. You're like, they have a point system, right? And a regular, Miss Cabbage told me this. I've never seen it. Like a regular run-of-the-mill recruit. You bring them in. It's worth like a couple of points. Then you work your way up to a class eight CS, a highly trained yes, yes, yes. person. Yeah. And the highly trained person is worth something like 12 points, right? And then he said, you want to know what a film director is worth in points in Sea Org recruitment? And I said, what? And he said, 20 points. That's the top. You get more points for recruiting 
a film director than anything else. Then how come they never recruited one? <laughs> I, I don't know. They do. Well, even more. <laughs> I mean, even, even his story is stupid. It's yeah, like... <laughs> even, yeah, I know. Even the, even the, he was trying to, he probably made that up to make me feel good. Like puff me up like, whoa, I'm worth more than a class HCS. But uh <laughs> Uh, which for your listeners, that is a very highly trained, uh, that's a big investment to get that high. But um, but even more importantly than how come they never recruited one is how come they never trained one. And the reason they never trained one is because, and this is uh, 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 the, probably the single most severe problem in the Sea Org, the reason that, that hampers them and stalls them the most is that the, the, the price they put on failure is so high and you can't do that, especially with creative people, especially when they're learning and going through their formative stages. They need to be able to produce in a safe space where they're not punished for screwing up. You know, one of the reasons why Google is one of the biggest companies in the world is because they create spaces where people can uh, explore and experiment and fail. You fail at Google, you get sent on vacation. You say, hey, my project is a disaster. I'm pulling the plug. They're like, thank you. You just saved us millions of dollars. Here's a bonus. Go on vacation. Figure out what you're going to do and come back. The Sierra does the exact opposite. They're like, great. You're going to the RPF. There's such a high price for failing. That's why they had to hire me. And I know this because a couple of weeks after I got up there, when I asked the question of the script supervisor, how come none of you guys want to direct? She said, oh, you, you can get in so much trouble doing that. And I was just like, oh, my God. You know, what have I gotten myself into? It so is. Um, it is. Yeah. It's a, it's actually a perfect anecdote for that illustrates one of the major failures of Scientology is it it's is, the price of failure. They're set up to fail. They right. make they make the I like how you put it. The, the price of failure, the cost of failure is so great. Right. Nobody eventually nobody wants responsibility. No, no. And and the fact is, Scientology, if you believe they're bullshit, they're supposed to be able to train you on how to do anything. They're supposed right. to be able to fix your mistakes doing anything. You're not supposed to have to have such massive systems of punishment for everything. Right. Right. Anyway, it's just one of the many contradictions that just... Yeah, uh, but I think I think being having been in the Zurich, you would recognize that at all the levels you were ever in, that there was this, this built-in cost for failure that was so excruciatingly high that it basically, there, you know, there's no oxygen for anybody to breathe because it's all soaked up by this high failure cost. Yeah. So, well, and, and the, the, the cost for failure goes up the closer you are to David Miscavige. Yes, that's, yeah, like I, I started, yeah, absolutely. Because I would notice the people that would then sort of jump into that inner orbit, man, they were just would end up, you know, without a skin. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, literally skinned alive and and towards the end of my career there as I got closer and I got really close but uh, I remember flying to uh, on a private jet with Ms. Gavage and Lou and a few other people over to the IS event I think it was in 2017 and then they were flying out of Denmark and I was I, I needed to go back to LA because I had some medical stuff going on and blah 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 nothing whatever but um I, you know, Lou came to me and we had a whole chat about, she's like, you know, uh, we really would like you to take a, but there's a bigger role for you in all of this. Like, you know, we want you to know there's even a, there's a bigger role. And I was thinking, I'm fucked. This is like the last thing you hear before you, you take that step off the cliff and you're right. So, uh, anyway, and, and it happened, you know, I did some things that I maybe shouldn't have done and, then the reaction to those things was because when you're at that level, it's just earth shattering. Yeah. So um, we, uh, you briefly mentioned that you sort of snuck out the back door during all the COVID lockdowns and yeah. everything. What's, what's your, what's your goal now? Like, where are you at personally in relation to this whole Scientology experience? What are you looking to do moving forward? You mean a career to make money so I can survive? No. Or, I, I mean, that, I with, mean that with respect to the whole Scientology thing, like what, what are you, are you, 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 I believe you're writing a book, right? It's almost done. Like, what is your goal? What is your, yeah. What's your goal with just with respect to Scientology? We're not talking about like career goals and like, you know, um, I'm tr cause I'm trying to avoid like being a greeter at Walmart, but I don't know if there's much else for me out there, but. Correct. Um, Just with respect to the Scientology stuff. Yeah, uh, I don't know what you mean. Like, uh, do I have a 
goal. I mean, are you speaking uh, about all this because it's cathartic? Are you trying to expose oh, I get what you're things? Saying. Are you okay? Um, so, what do you want people to know? Well, the thing is, yeah, it's, it is cathartic, but I'm not just doing it for the self. I would do it for just a selfish reason. You, you need to. Did you find it cathartic when you started speaking out? Was it part of a healing I, process, or I think you were gone I for feel, so long at that point? For so long, what? I think you were out of Scientology so long, a long time before you started speaking out. So, no, no. no? Mm -mm. Oh. oh, that's I mean, right. I, you were posting while you were still under the radar. I mean, I got declared in 2014. Yeah. When was, when was the aftermath show? Um. Well, for me, that was a long time ago. I hope I get declared. I just they probably won't declare me. Oh man, such so, a life. So, so what's your, what? What's your goal? Where Where are you at? Um, where Where are you? Where are you today with respect to all of this Scientology stuff? Like, are you writing the book so that you can move on and never talk about it again? Oh, no, you... I, will, I will. I Well, I mean, I don't want to make that my raison d'etre. I don't want that to be my reason for living. Um, but I think it's important when you spend as much time as I did doing as much important stuff. I mean, gee, is it like I think, Aaron, that my production record is greater than any Sea Org members in history. I was looking the other day. I had to turn in my production record, uh, which is, you know, a list of everything you did. I had to turn it in, and it was only from 2014 to like 2018. And it was just, I'm like, oh my God. I was shocked at how much stuff I'd gotten done. So, um, so what made you want to write your book? Um, that was definitely cathartic. I mean, I, I like writing, and I was not in a good mental state. And I was kind of, uh, uh, I say no more. But I found it, I needed to focus on something because I was really kind of not in great shape. And so I, I thought I want to write about my experience starting when I was about 15 years old so that people will really understand my journey into that person I was, you know, drug addicted and traumatized in, in my own life and how I fell into Scientology and about how it appeared to be this thing that then morphed into something else. And, you know, I, I thought it was an interesting story and I needed to focus on it. And I needed to like um, unpack it. Like I needed to not just say, and then this happened and this happened and this happened. And I needed to not just say that and then say, and this is how I felt about it. But I needed to go one level deeper and think, why is it that a person would even arrive at that kind of place? So I really did a lot of sort of deep intellectual plumbing of my own consciousness to try to figure out, well, how do we get there? And there's a lot of funny anecdotes in it. And there's a lot of stories and, I, I didn't mention Mark Headley, but <laughs> I probably should go back and mention him. Uh, but it's, I, I found it I found it really cathartic, and I didn't have any work, and I wasn't doing anything, and I didn't want to sit around and feel sorry for myself because really I ended up at the point where I'm like, I think I'd rather be dead than work for Scientology. It's not a good place to be. Like, what if the only way you could survive was to work for Scientology? I'm like, then I won't survive. Because it gets to a certain point where you, once you begin to pull your head out of the reality distortion field and you start to see this stuff and you realize, you know, there's no backroom strategy that takes place where David Miscavige decides, you know, how he's going to screw people over. It's just, it's the consciousness. It's the matrix. It, 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 like people really are in this and they really believe it. I mean, I could talk to you about this endlessly when I did OT3 and I opened the pack and I read that. It explained a lot for me, right? If you got, if you were in therapy, let's say, and you one day said to your therapist, I got really upset the other day. I got really triggered. And then I realized I didn't have to be triggered. And you, then you were like, okay, you're like, I don't have to do this. I recognize the chain of events that led to me being triggered. Your therapist would say, wow, would think we've, we're getting somewhere. We're making progress because that would be a milestone in therapy that you would actually realize that you don't have to have things trigger you. When you read the OT3 material, it's not that different. All of a sudden, you have a reason to think, I'm upset, I'm triggered, but it's not me. It's something else. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's a different way of saying I don't have to be triggered. Because mm. that's, those aren't my emotions. That's somebody else's emotions. It's a BT's emotions. And that explains everybody's behavior and everybody's weirdness and craziness, right? 
Did you get what I'm saying? Like they're, they're well, in some ways, it should make Scientologists more compassionate and empathetic for other people that yeah, it, they're yeah. not that they have all these right. It, what you're describing no. should should make empathetic Scientologists, but it doesn't really work out that way. It doesn't. And guess what? That day that I read that and I walked out, I was a more empathetic person. Okay, <laughs> but I was truly, and and that is true. Um, but unfortunately mean dog owners, mean people have mean dogs, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a fact. And right now, Scientology is run by a mean dog owner. So it's that sphere of influence. I think there's a lot of things that prevent that concept that, well, for one thing, it's a lie. You're talking to your therapist and you say, I realized I don't have to be triggered. I actually saw the chain of events uh, which led up to it and I, I, I see it and I don't, and it really helped me because now I, I'm more, my emotions are more regulated. Uh, and that's based on actual self-awareness, but thinking that it's coming from another consciousness that's inhabiting your body, that's a lie. So that's, even though it might mechanically have the same outcome for a short period, you're not really getting the self-awareness. It's, it's like a, it's like a fake mechanism. My poor dog has to go pee, but, oh. um, so you, you get what I'm saying? I think so. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. It should make people more compassionate, but or has the potential to. But it's not based on anything. It's it's based on a on a on a, on a big fat lie. It's. Uh, but I think people don't they don't understand that to get that information out of context in a cartoon like on South Park as opposed to being in a course room with a bunch of other people and nobody else is throwing their pack up in the air and saying, this is bullshit, I'm out of here. So why should you? It's different when you get it in that context. It's very different. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm just telling you how it hit me. You yeah, know, yeah. Eventually, eventually I just like was like, I had to seek another, another method of, of becoming emotionally regulated and understanding the universe. Cause boy, that one just leads you down a really bad path. Cause it, it is bullshit. How much, I know you, if you got to go and um, take care of your dog, let me know. But how high on the bridge did you get? Case I did, I did OT5 many, many years ago. Okay. Would you just give me one second? Yeah. Would you mind? Okay, hold on. Hey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what'd you say? Oh, I was just uh, saying hello to the chat. Oh, yeah. No, I just uh, opened the door for him so he could go out. Oh, good. Um, okay, so, and we don't have to make, we don't have to, like, um, cover everything we could ever want to talk about in this. We couldn't. In, in this chat here. Yeah, it wouldn't be possible. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, OT5. But, I mean, I, I didn't do any bridge. For, once I went to gold, I mean, I didn't do any more Scientology auditing. I mean, I got a lot of sec checks and stuff like that, but. You know, when I first got there, one of the exec RTC executives came to me and said, you know, Dave wants you to know that he doesn't want it to be a problem that, for you to go up the bridge because you're here. Because, you know, you can't, I'm not going to be there and like still be public somewhere else. Right. Mm -hmm. So he said, just don't worry about it. You can do your bridge here. It's free. We're, you're never going to be charged, whatever. So it was like, I could do whatever I wanted, but I never did any because you're not going to have any time. Did we mention that? You're not going to have any time. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I, yeah. What did you observe? Um, what did you observe at the int base that um, you would describe as very poor quality of life? Well, just the lack of freedom. Um, it's like what it's 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 the lack of having meaningful relationships with people. I mean, come on. It's like I, I worked with a guy and he was typical of a, a lot of people. He was there before I got there. He was there for the whole whole time I was there, and he's still there. He's never been married. Hello, I mean the, he's like you know he's a sixty five year old virgin or whatever. It's just like it's just I mean there's three hundred people up there. What's the guy going to do? The human relationships, human contact is so important, and and the kind. You know, you're not going to find a mate there. And if you find a mate, you're not going to start a family. I mean, all that stuff is like poor quality of life. Just the fact that you can't leave, the fact that you can't, you know, take a short meal and then 
to, you know, drive down to Starbucks down the street. Um, you know, you know, if you, it's just, it's just, you know, having your, how about having your mail read? How about having your phone calls listened to? How about, um, you know, living in this fear that if you make a mistake, you're going to have every aspect of your life examined under a, you know, a thousand power microscope, right? You know, and God forbid, you know, you, you, you know, you, you engaged in a, a, a solo 2D, uh, uh, what do you call it? A solo 2D assist. Yeah, solo 2D assist. You'd be uh, like, you know, you would be literally dragged in front of the crew at muster and, and, you know, accused of being, you know, a masturbator. Show so, them what you did. Show yeah. them all right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, are you sure Dave right now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you know, the Puritans, you know, they had nothing on Scientology. It's just, like, you know, uh, all, of the, all of the devices that the Puritans developed to shame people was, uh, you know, yeah. Scientology took that to a whole new level. They, they took, anyway. You know, what I'd really like to do, Mitch, is just do like a whole series of different chats with you about different topics because uh, it'd be impossible to cover it all. And yet, you know me, I'm always like, in, I, I always have this like, uh, desire to try to cover it all and it's just not possible um and so it's funny like i brought you on calling you scientology's film director but i, I haven't asked you a single question about directing films <laughs> you know what i'm saying i feel yeah, a little i, I feel a little I, bad I yeah i mean it's i yeah i mean i did the uh well uh, you know I, we can tell the world you know i sent you that email about tr13 uh because I, I i felt i needed to share that with you because when i was writing my book and I got to the chapter. Uh, it always really disturbed me that in that particular technical training film, which is made to train auditors, that the main character, well, the, the 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 character in the, in the film, who has committed a crime and is going to get some auditing to because they they they're tr they need to know what his crime was, and the crime that Hubbard chose was that he you know drugged and raped his best friend's girlfriend. And it, I mean, it bugged me the second I opened the script. I'm like, what? Why would you pick that crime? There's so many other ways. Uh, and then when the Danny Masterson thing happened, I was just like, holy shit. And nobody was really thinking with that, that film, right? Because here's this guy, he rapes and drugs a girl. He gets some auditing and then he's okay. And nobody has to go to the police. But even more importantly, the film says, Scientology technology can reform a criminal and can heal a victim. And that's what they're teaching auditors while in real life they're doing the opposite. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, for me, the directing stuff all has, you know, it leads to the thinking and the philosophy behind the films. I had a lot of trouble with some of those films in terms of conceptually what was in them. I mean, I was really being a horror by just taking the money to do them. Because there, you know, there was racism and chauvinism and all kinds of stuff in those films. In which, the films. You know, oh yeah. Hmm. Well, not so much in the films. I mean, the the film How to Set Up a Session and and the E Meter, the one that took place in Africa. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, was yeah, one yeah. of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. You probably didn't see the second one. Did you see the one with Larry Anderson? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I did it again. The second one was even better. And hmm. then. The guy who played the Larry Anderson part, who wasn't a Scientologist, he was needed for some pickup shots at a later time. And he said, fuck off. I won't work for Scientology. So <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So I was just like, ah, uh, damn. Um, so wait, wait. How come he worked for Scientology the first time? Well, he was just a, an actor from, from San Francisco. We hired him. I cast him. He's, he, okay. he was cast, like casting session. I understand the, that. He, he was the one who replaced the Larry Anderson part. He was but, a really good actor. But then he'd become really sour on Scientology because a lot of stuff had come out. And uh, he, he's like, no, I'm not going to work for you guys. I you see. Know, he, he, once he discovered that they were like a, you know, a, a family, you know, busting, you know, trapped, how did, whatever. How did they fix that with the pickup shots? I don't remember. I, I, I'm trying to think. I think what happened was uh, the, maybe they did something CGI but the film became earmarked for a redo again. Oh, wow. Which is really a shame because, man, I went to town on that film. I mean, I had them hire giraffes and rhinoceroses and for background actors. And it was pretty crazy. But um, Hey, what did yeah. they do to fix the TR4 film? Oh, I reshot the whole thing. 
It's all mm -hmm. done. All yeah. Finally, Ms. Gabbage came to me and said, um, it, you know, I'd done all of the tech films except that one. And people would say, so what do you, I said, uh, th they would ask me, I direct tech films. And I would have to say, I did all the films except TR4 because I, I'm kind of honest that way. I don't want to take credit for somebody else's work. Plus, keep talking, I, I can hear you. I, I got yeah, no play. problem. Plus, I don't want to be credited for that particular film. So, um, but he came to me one day and he said, you know, um, Ron, you know, uh, uh, Hubbard hated that film. Uh, he it was never the film that he wanted. He said, "So let's just reshoot it." So we reshot the whole thing. Of and, course, that's the only way Miscavige could ever get anyone to do anything is by pretending it's what Elrin Hubbard wanted. Well, you know, I, to be all that's true. You're absolutely right. He had to have that whole scenario. But to be all honest with you, I to be on in all fairness to the situation, when they finished a the film, they would take all of the, the the material from the film, all of the notes all of the script notes, uh, any set recordings that were done that not the recordings of actors, but they used to follow Hubbard around on the set. The messengers would follow him and they would record everything he said. So there were hundreds and hundreds of hours, maybe not hundred, maybe a hundred hours of these tape recordings. And the, that material, would they'd put it in a big trunk, like a big steamer trunk. And it would usually fill somewhere from a half to a full truck. But that TR4 film that you mentioned, that filled two trunks. That that because it was a long film, and they spent a year. They they shot for months, then they shut down for months while he did a bunch of technical work, and then uh, they sh finished the rest of the film. So then, when I got the, uh, the the assignment to redo it, the first thing I did was I got rid of I got a hold of everything on those trunks, and I, I started reading all of Hubbard's notes. I listened to his tapes directing people. I listened to the guy who stars in that film, you know, who's not in Scientology anymore. He, uh, Hubbard took him into the trailer and coached him on TRs. And it's, Oh, do you mean like, Dan Coon? Yeah. He took him into a trailer and coached him on TRs. And so I listened to all this stuff and I can tell you he, that was not the film he wanted. He w finally gave up in desperation and said, fuck it. I need something in the orgs to show people TRs. I'll go with it. But he really didn't like the film, but this was a revelation because everybody thought, you know, that film will never be made because it was L. Ron Hubbard directing people on how to do TRs. And then when I listened to the tapes, I was like, wow, he really thought they all did a really shitty job. <laughs> so and, and just goes to show you, not even L. Ron Hubbard could train people how to do TRs. <laughs> yeah, well, well it, but it is different to, to, to teach them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. it's so silly. Especially, it's so silly. Guy, especially Dan Kuhn, who had so much technical training. And he couldn't even pull it off to Hubbard's, um, you know, Dan is, is a really smart guy. I mean, I knew him. He's like not a dummy. Uh, but yeah. So, you know, I took the lazy way out and then I would take actors. Some of them weren't Scientologists and I would just play parts of the tape to them. And I'd say, here, just do what he's saying. Like I wouldn't even try to make it up again. There's no reason to, because I was more concerned with how it looked and camera angles and, yeah. and stuff like that. But yeah, I just reshot the whole thing. Okay, so we have a question here for you. Yeah. Um, hey, hey, Mitch, my mom and dad were are at the Gold Base. Did you know them? Diane Anderson, video librarian, Phil Anderson in sales. Well, Phil's been gone forever. Gone from where? The base. He left forever ago. I, I know Diane. She, Your mom used to be a ballerina, I think, before she joined this year, when she was a young girl. Yeah, I know Diane. But her husband, Phil, he, he blew like he escaped. I don't know like a long time ago. So I don't know what the deal with that is. Really? Did you know Phil? Yeah. Um, did he work with you at all? Uh, not a, no, he worked with me like, okay. So in the early days, um, we used, uh, the, you know, you could, Hubbard originally started, the actors, the cast were comprised of staff members, right? Like all of the early films, they were all staff members. They didn't hire actors. Right. By the time I got there, they were hiring actors for the leads, but all of the smaller parts uh, were given to staff members. Mm -hmm. So I'd worked with Phil on, he was on the set a couple of times, so I spoke with him. So we never really worked together. I think he might have been in editing for a while in a lower position. So I may have interacted with him. But he's not like, I didn't work with him. But I knew them. They were nice people. There's a lot of nice people up there, I should say. So the last time you were there, the last you knew, Diane Anderson was still there? Oh, yeah. 
And so if you say Phil blew the base, he may or may not, you don't know whether he was recovered and is at some other Sea Org base or something. Yeah, I, I would be really surprised if he was. You think he's out of Scientology? Uh, yeah, if you ask me to guess, I would say that. Okay. Um, well, because he's definitely still in. He disconnected from his daughter, Laura. Um, oh, is she left? And so, oh, really? oh, Phil is still in, huh? Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess that's why she doesn't know, I guess. But, okay, so he's, he must yeah, still be in. Okay, good. But yeah, I, I know your mom, and I, she's a, a lovely person. I really like her. Um, hey, so when do you think your book will be out? Oh, God, I don't know. I, I got to stop doing uh, appearing on you know, on the internet and get it done. I'm hoping to finish it in the next really couple of days and then go through a second draft. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, I have some people. I don't have much of a budget, so I... Um, I have a couple of people who volunteered to help me edit it and they're doing incredible work. I mean, it's like, they just want to do it. They, they were people that Mike Rinder found for me. You know, he, uh, he said, Hey, do you want me to reach out into my community and see if there's anybody that'll help you edit this book? And I got a couple of people that have been really, you know, qualified people to do this editing work. So it's pretty much edited, but it, it's going to have to be a second draft that hopefully won't take that long. And then, I'll probably just put it out on uh, Kindle Direct Publishing because, you know, the publishing world has been disrupted the same way the music world was. You know, you don't need a publisher anymore, except it's, it's controlled by Amazon. It's true. Yeah, it really is true. I mean, you just, you just freaking do it. It's like putting music out. You know, you can just, you can, there's people out there that have, you know, they're massively, massively successful on Spotify, right? And they're, they don't have a record company. So I'm not looking for success. I just, I want this story to be put out this way. I'm hoping uh, within the next couple of months, it'll be out. I, and I just, I need to find somebody to help me format it and get it onto to Amazon. I could do all that myself, but it's really time consuming. What, um, what will your book be focusing on? What part of your story, or is it just the entire story? Well, it's pretty much the entire story. I mean, it's, it's uh, as I said, the first three chapters are my backstory. You know, which is, you know, I think it's kind of interesting. I guess everybody thinks their life's interesting. But, um, you know, I grew up in a really formative time and in the 60s. And I grew up in Laurel Canyon, which is a really famous place. You know, it's considered to be the, you know, the, the it was the center of the Southern California music scene. I mean, when I was a teenager, we used to hear bands like the birds, like you could hear them practicing on, you know, Cass, Cass Elliott's back porch. I mean, it was it was like that. So I was kind of a witness to all of that stuff, and, you know, uh, sneaking into Ciro's to see the birds with Bob Dylan and, or, or the house band at the whiskey who was like the doors. And then by some strange coincidence, I ended up in art school in uh, the Bay area in 1967 when I started college, which was the summer of love. I'm sure everybody's heard of that. Right. So I was kind of that, that summer in golden gate park, when all of that hippie stuff happened and the whole counterculture was exploding. And, and so I was kind of a witness to all of that. And a number of people have read that and they're just like, if I just wrote about that, they'd be happy. Cause they're like, this is like amazing. Like you saw all that stuff happen. And then it all transitions into how I got into Scientology from that into Scientology. And then it just kind of goes through all the different things. I mean, I worked on, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. It talks about the tech films and, you know, I did a bunch of exhibits like the LRH Life exhibit and I did the, you know, Museum of Industry of Death. And then I did all the audio visual uh, stuff on Superpower. And each one of those projects has some just amazing stories surrounding it. So it's kind of based around my activities. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, did I answer your question? So <laughs> Probably. I think so. Yeah, Probably. Just w w which part of your story is your? Um, uh, are you going to try to cover in your book? So yeah, I mean that's you're pretty try much to cover it. all of it. Yeah, I mean I have a chapter on SMP. I have a chapter on working at ASI with uh, Miss Gavage when we were redoing the Narcanon program, because all of these are like a nexus into a, a dimension of Scientology. Like I need to talk about the pure up, so I need the jumping off point. You can't just go the pure up. You know the jumping off point was. Uh, a very important individual needed to do a PRF and nobody could know about it. And so I was their twin. And then that gives, that's an interesting story. And then it gives me a chance to talk about the PRF, you know? So, um, 
it, it kind of goes like that. It's kind of like it, I used uh, my work on the industry of death museum to talk about uh, Scientology's, uh, you know, battle against psychiatry and how it started and, you know, what the truth of all that is and blah, blah, blah. So, because, hmm. you know, I, I worked on all that stuff. So it's kind of like. Um, there was one, I was just going to ask you another question about that. Oh my God. What was I going to ask you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, has Scientology tried to do anything to you to prevent you from doing anything you're planning on doing? No, uh, they haven't. I mean, I, I've been pretty kind of invisible. So, and I kind of don't, I don't No, they haven't. The answer is no. And do no. I care? Do I care? No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because I have to imagine um, something's coming. I don't know. I don't know. The biggest problem for me is if they offered me a lot of money, it would be turning it down. So <laughs> let's put it up there. How much would be too much to turn down? Oh, uh, no, I'm just not going to do that. I'm totally joking. The 10 mil? Even... 20 I'm mil? Just, yeah. No, I told I told Dave, I'll take 50 mil. I'll shut the channel down. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay. No, I like I think, your, I li Aaron, I like your numbers. I think I joked it was I would take 20 mil. I was like, just 20 mil, Dave. That's all it's going to take. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then some people got so mad. Oh, my God. How could you even say that? First of all, shut up. It's a joke. Yeah. Second of all, it's $20 million. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I was just joking too. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, That's no, funny. seriously, because you have probably you got a lot of info. Yeah, I do, but I would like to think the most important of it is mm -hmm. an understanding of how we sort of all got there, not necessarily what anybody did. You get what I'm saying? Well, sure. I mean, to the extent that um, I always feel like if the response that you hear to any particular Scientology story is, my God, how could you be so stupid as to fall for X? Then I always feel a little right. sad because I go, well, you haven't understood the story. Because if you think that yeah. only happens to crazy or stupid people, then you don't actually understand the story. No, you don't. Um, and so I think that's what you mean. It's more important. How did we all get here? Not necessarily what did each person do while, while they were there. And I'm not just talking, yes, that's right. And I'm not just talking about how did we get there who were in Scientology. I mean, as humanity, how do we all get into these freaking situations? Like, what is it about human behavior and human perception that leads us down these paths? Uh, I mean, anybody who thinks anybody who joins something like Scientology is stupid. I mean, they can just fuck up for one thing. Unless you had an experience like that, you'll never understand it. You were in no place to criticize. But the other thing is, it happens to more smart people than it happens to stupid people. So if it hasn't happened to you, the chances are more because are are, very, are also there that you're stupid. Okay, you're just <laughs> you're just too stupid to fall into a cult because you know. Look at the guys like what's his name, Mark Vincente, the guy from Nexium. Yeah. Uh, you know who I'm talking about? Who I do. I do. And I've heard people say that. I've heard even certain academics yeah. say yeah. that. You're never going to fucking hear me say that. That sounds like that sounds like a pretty <laughs> weird flex to be like, I joined a cult because I'm smarter than you. Well, no, but I, I'm not saying I, that. I know that's not what you're saying. I yeah. have heard it said by people <laughs> who claim to be academics that it, it happens. It's easier to fall into cults when you're big brained. I mean, it, it, you're never going to hear me say that. I mean, I know there are studies who say that. I'm responding yeah. to the studies, Mitch. I'm not responding to you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I get it. And, and I'm not, I'm not, in a, I'm not, I'm trying to be humorous. You know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to cut down those people that are like, how could you be so stupid? Totally. And I'm trying to say, well, maybe you're too stupid to join a cult. Okay. <laughs> so that's all. It's just like, it's like I'll take 50 million bucks. It's just a joke. But. <laughs> But um, um, yeah, so yeah, it's just like, uh, I, I mean, there are uh, I, some of the most emotionally and intellectually illiterate people I've ever met are in the Sea Org, and some of the smartest people I've ever met are in the Sea Org. So when it comes to uh, intelligence, it's definitely an equal opportunity employer. Yeah. I mean, there, there were people that left that base. If I were people I had to work with, there were some people that I was just good riddance, man. Hmm. I never want to see that person again. 
And there were also some people that I, you know, miss to this day who, who yeah. went on, one of them who I spoke to who went on and had a fabulously successful career. Uh, so since it's so getting it's getting a little late, let me just, um, just one of the questions I saw in the chat here that sure. rem reminded me of this question. Uh, theoretically speaking, they could have hired or trained a Sea Org member to be a director, but for 30 years, they hired you as a professional and paid you to do it instead. Is that an accurate statement? That's an like accurate the, statement. Yeah. Theoretically, there's nothing that was preventing them from filling that post of Golden Air Productions director with a Sea Org member if they thought it would work. That's correct. And I brought other directors up there or sponsored them. So they hired a few other professional directors. Um, and then I did successfully train a Sea Org member, uh, greatly assist in the training of a Sea Org member who is successfully directing and he's very good. His mm. work is at least as good as mine was. So, I mean, just in that context, I don't know if he could work in any other context, but his work's really good. And it is possible in order for me to do that. I mean, I, I had to work with him for seven years before I could get anybody's agreement that he could be the one in charge on a set, I had to agree that anything he screwed up, I would do over at no charge. But mostly I had to go to qual to the qualifications division, which is in, which is uh, in charge of training people. And I had to say, I'm training this guy. Okay. And so what I tell you to do with him, that's what you're going to do. And you're not going to fuck with him and you're going to give him lots of leeway because I'm going to, you know, cause they were always like, we want you to apprentice our people. So I also created this space in which this guy, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, like uh, they study on Saturdays. So I would make sure that I gave him lots of assignments to watch movies. And then, you know, I'd have to make it like he'd have to write an essay. I'd have to print notes off the Internet about a film. I'd find some film, film theoretician who wrote an article about some film that I wanted to see. So I'd say, here, read this, watch the film, write an essay. You know how they are. They, you can't just learn something. You have to, like, do all this stuff. You know, you have to, like, write an essay showing that you learned it, right? Yeah. So, you know, I did this for this guy. And so he got to see a lot of movies. And uh, he got a lot of very specialized training. So it is possible. But it, I guess it really took somebody from the outside to train them. Yeah. Plus, he, this guy was a total fluke. He was, he was, I mean, I recognized him on the crew. He was so eager and interested he was a video guy. He just did video recording of what you're filming and keep track of it. And uh, he was so thirsty and interested and, you know, that he, uh, I went, Hey, I'm going to teach you to be a director. Cause I wanted to get the fuck out of there. I want my whole, my main purpose was I wanted to go up there and make help that organization so that I could leave and it would be okay. Right. And, and that was just a trap. It was a total yeah. trap. But even this guy turned into a, fucking asshole it's just like it happens to people <laughs> like i'm right? serious like well i left one to smp and when i came back he was like he had the crew that i used to have and he was in charge of it and he was just like a fucking mean motherfucker i'm like wow this really that's the way it goes oh yeah that's the way it goes yeah you have um, to, yeah, <clears throat> yeah go ahead well i mean i'm just i just wanted to say as you think of different things if there's specific subjects or topics um that you think uh, you want to do chats with me about more than happy to do them. And yeah, no uh, maybe we can keep mentioning your book and uh, maybe we'll help you help you sell a few copies once it finally comes out. Cause I'm sure people would be fascinated to um, get a whole lot more of the behind the scenes. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think just that the writing is interesting enough in and of itself as a piece of writing that people will, will um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I think it's pretty good. I, I do. So, um, I mean, I, I, you know, one of the things I did for the church, I wrote for 20 years. I mean, 28 years. I wrote so much stuff. I mean, I wrote, you know, it was kind of like I couldn't stop. So then I just wrote about <laughs> what, you know, I mean, I have a lot, I had a lot of experience writing. So. Yeah. Are you considering starting uh, your own channel where you can just tell your own stories as you see fit? I mean, I've thought about it because I'll tell you honestly, I, there's some things like I have this thing, maybe I'll make a series of videos about it. They're called my Scientology pet peeves. I just have these pet peeves, these things that really bother me. We talked about them, one of them the other day that like it bothers me when people refer to the Sea Org as a paramilitary organization because, you know, they're no more a paramilitary organization than the Salvation Army. And I'm not trying to defend them, but that's just not the way, like that's not going to lead anywhere. 
there, there, you know, there's never going to be an armed insurrection led by Sea Org members. The whole thing is just a costume party to stroke Hubbard's ego. That's all it ever was. And so you should see it that way. You should like look at it that way. But instead, people are like, oh, they're like the Navy, whatever. So but they're what not. About the, what about the idea that you're on call all the time? You can be sent anywhere at any time for any reason and you cannot question authority. What if that's what people mean when they say paramilitary? I don't think that's enough. That sounds to me like uh, I think there's emergency medical workers who are under, under that same threat. So I, I, but just not constantly for the rest of their lives. But no, I don't think so. I, I think to be paramilitary, you have to be organized around uh, defensive or offensive battle warfare with weapons and where, in which people die. I mean, you know, the, the militia in America, those guys, they're paramilitary. The, you know, the death squads in El Salvador, which aren't part of the government, they're paramilitary. You know, it's just like, like I don't use I don't use that word to describe the Sea Org because yeah. uh, I don't feel like I need to. But when and I remember having the same reaction when I first heard paramilitary and then I looked up the definition and I thought, oh, maybe it just means something a little different than than what I thought. But what's another one of your Scientology pet peeves? Um, the fact that Hubbard has. uh taken a lot of very helpful stuff like you can walk into a church of scientology and you can do a basic thing you can learn some tool like you can learn about the arc triangle or you can learn about so one of these basic things and you can translate that into a, a, a helpful tool that can actually be useful in your daily life almost uh almost instantly or in very short order and yet it, he's doing that to lure you in to this bigger trap and I think a lot of us, we don't even want to talk about these, these beneficial things on the lower end of the bridge because we don't want to accidentally ha have somebody go, oh, I think I'll check that out. It sounds good. Because that stuff's everywhere. You can get, you can get as many helpful tools on YouTube as you can on Future Search Scientology. Wait, so and which part of this is your pet peeve? That part. The part that there's so much good stuff at the beginning of the bridge. That, but then eventually you end up in a course room reading about the fact that you're inhabited by uh, entities that are not you and that you have a great deal of difficulty distinguishing between your thoughts and the entity's thoughts. That's, you know, but which part of, which part of that is the pet peeve? The pet peeve is that he starts that way. Like what the, in all honesty, they should just start by saying, okay, here's the deal. Like you should walk in the church and there should be a big sign that says 72 trillion years ago, there was, there was a galactic, just you know and your body is they should just say it and believe it or not probably more people would get into scientology if they read that than they are now because a lot of people love that stuff they they really are attracted to that kind of crazy stuff so but it's they true that's actually that's actually why i said uh, the fact that you can go online and read about xenu for a long time i used to think that's what destroyed scientology and i've come to have a different view on it the fact that you can find out the crazy shit Scientologists believe has nothing to do with why Scientology is failing as an organization. No, it's because of how it treats its people. It's because of how it treats its yeah, people. Yeah, how it, that's it, period. It's how it treats its people. It's just like, you know, I could I could tell you how the OT3 data uh, explains a lot of things. I don't believe it, but I could tell it to you. Okay. Right. But it's just like. So do you consider yourself to be an independent Scientologist? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> <laughs> fucking kidding um like no it's scientology is an utter complete i mean it, yeah it's just I, I, well, no just in a sh in short absolutely not i mean i i'm shocked at the times when i he, my brain my mind something slips in there and i'm like whoa i got that from scientology i mean i i okay so uh, probably 15 years ago I started training myself to not use Scientology lingo because as a writer, as a person who loves language, I found it really, I, I, I felt that the language was threatened because language gets destroyed in Scientology when everybody you know says, yeah, 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 we had a great comm cycle or uh, we need to be in comm or let's get in comm. And they're all saying like the same crap, excuse me. Um, it's wrong. Like use your imagination. Like think of another way of saying it. Keep your brain, uh, you know, plastic and facile. So I, I made a point of not using all of these terms just because I thought it was uh, stifling to do it. So I kind of had that going for me when I decided to leave. Uh, and sometimes I still catch myself. 
So anyways, that's that's the degree to which I don't consider myself. I, yeah, I mean, I'm not an independent Scientologist. Cool. I, I, yeah. Coolio. Um, well, Mitch, let's let's uh, let's do a bunch of chats like this um, in the future. Yeah. So anytime and, uh, you want. Yeah. Very cool. Maybe we'll try to keep it topical. Like um, like if I do a video and you're like, oh, shit, man, you don't know the half of this. Let me tell you this story, the real story behind this. Then we'll like do a chat on that. So stuff like that. Yeah, I think it would also be, you know, we should do something with other like it, it would be fun or not just fun, but I think it would be illuminating um to do one with maybe jackson and or mark because we were all there together and mark so, fisher or mark headley uh, mark headley I, I mean i didn't i never knew mark fisher so oh okay. mark, we overlapped by a few months and while i was being you know um love bombed into working there he was having you know being punched in the face in the garage so i didn't know that or i might have yeah, we were there. I mean, I got As there like January. Does. Huh? As one does. Exactly. I, I got there in January, February. I think they left around September, he and Janice. So we sort of overlapped, but we didn't know each other. I actually know Janice. Uh, I'd met her once because she was Yvonne's daughter and I knew Yvonne really well. So, but yeah, I didn't know. But, you know, Mark was, he was my junior. I'm, I don't really like putting it that way. Yeah, for a couple <laughs> years. No, he was. For a couple of years, he was the shoe crew chief. So he was one of my juniors. That very strange position when you're at the second to the top of a, a Sea Org division and you're what they call NSO, which uh, stands for non-Sea Org. But you have all these people under your charge, all these Sea Org members. I mean, they're like, you're their boss. You know, you, you, you know, yeah. yeah so it's, it's that, it, that, yeah, very strange. Uh, I'll tell you that story. Remind me to tell you the story about how David Miscavige uh, put my name personally. He put it on the org board and like he walked up, put the piece of tape on the org board. And then s somebody in HCO was like, oh, you have to see this, you know, like you should be the most blessed, thankful person in the world. And I was like, that is like, he took a pin, a needle and stuck it through a, a doll, like a voodoo doll and it pinned me to the org board. Okay. Because it is impossible to get yourself off a Scientology org board in the Sea Org. You know that. It's Almost dull. as hard as getting off their mailing list. Yeah, yeah. It might be a little harder. It's like herpes. It ain't going away. Hey, do you still so, get mail? You know, believe it or not, I hardly ever do. Um, I, some mail comes to my house because one of my kids was doing some Scientology. There, nobody in my family is in Scientology. I did get this recently. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Well, I can't read it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, you can. It's totally out of focus. Uh, this is the, it's a, uh, apparently there's a, uh, all of the richest people in Scientology went on a little journey to Italy as a kind of a fundraiser for the LRH Hall. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I'll send it to you if you want. Uh, it's really, it's beautiful. Uh, you know, it's so beautifully. Uh, produced but it's there's probably anyway i i got that i was really like what the hell so but, you know do a fundraiser for a, a, a an event hall they're trying to build building clearwater a whole bunch of people went to italy yeah they i didn't actually read it but they're all in italy and um it's called uh it's for lr it was an event they held for lrh hall members uh and they took them all to italy and wine and dine them and they did i'm sure it, it's a very nice, you know, expensive trip. And then they all donated more money. It was for all of the people that donated money to the LRH Hall. So, well, praise Zenu. I'm sure it was all worth it. Yeah. No, I'm, like if you're one of those people, you're living in the, if you want to see what kind of magnificent bubble they're all living in, you can just look at this thing because it's, it's pretty freaking crazy. But it's just like, you know, it's like this is printed in the blood of Sea Org members. Wow. So, well, getting, all right, getting... everyone. All right. Getting a little late for me here on a Sunday evening. So why don't we, uh, why don't we wrap it up here? Uh, I hope you all have enjoyed this chat with Mitch Brisker. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Much more to come in the future. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Thanks for doing it with me, Mitch. I appreciate no it. No problem. Good night, everyone. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, oh, you can't keep on my love.
and you could click. Wow!